On the 6th of February 2014, five friends set out on what they hoped would be an exhilarating and enjoyable day out in the deepest caves of Northern Europe, where they'd be able to explore the untouched mysteries of the underwater world. Unfortunately, excitement would quickly turn to horror and these majestic natural wonders would become a dark and icy grave. I am very claustrophobic, so this case hit me. Just the deep sea creeps me out, never mind what happened to these people. But before we dive in, if you enjoy my videos and you want to see my next one, drop this one a like and subscribe if you are new. Comments help as well. Thank you. Plorogotta is a cave in Rana, Norway, and attracts more divers than any other caves in the area due to the high waters and distinctive limestone formations. The Plora River, once a substantial waterway, has its origins in Lake Calvanet, flowing through the Plora Valley. In the 1950s, the damming of the lake significantly altered its flow, leaving the eroded passages below, once unreachable, now open to exploration for the brave. February in Rana is bitterly cold, with lows below freezing point, and it was in these chilly conditions that Patrick Gronquist, Yari Hutarinen, Vesa Rantanen, Yari Usamaki, and Kai Kankanen set out on their adventure in good spirits. Travelling from Finland to explore the Plura Caves, all five men were experienced underwater cave explorers, with some of them having already ventured to the spot previously. Regardless of expertise levels, caving is one of the most hazardous form of diving due to the confined spaces, limited visibility, and the potential for disorientation. It also requires a lot of specialized equipment, training, and experience. Cave diving is what is known as penetration diving, meaning that in an emergency, a diver cannot swim vertically to the surface. So when something goes wrong, the chances of a fatality become exponentially higher. The Plora Caves in particular add even more complexities due to the very tight passages and extreme cold. The trip had been planned by Kai, a 46-year-old electrical contractor from Vantar and had already been rescheduled several times due to the various conflicting commitments. Kai had a taste of tragedy one year earlier when he was involved in an accident in Piksamaki, central Finland, in the Montola Quarry. While under the ice, he noticed his diving partner didn't have his mouthpiece in. He dragged him out of the water, but it was already too late. Kai had stopped diving for a few months, but decided not to let the incident keep him away from the caves for too long. He dived frequently with his friends. 42-year-old Patrick, a fireman from Porvu, Yarihu Tarinen, a 40-year-old production manager, and Visa, a 32-year-old electrical designer. It was while he was with these friends, later that same year, that disaster struck for a second time. The four men, accompanied by eight others, were headed towards a shipwreck west of Tallinn, Estonia, when one of them would disappear. His body later discovered by Kai, Patrick and Visa, 70 meters below the surface. About 10 cave divers a year die on average, according to the International Journal of Aquatic Research. Though that number doesn't seem high, the number of cave divers is also fairly small, making this a high-risk sport with a well-connected international community. The risk are something that fans of this extreme sport accept, even when they experience brushes with death firsthand. Their curiosity driving them back into the deadly but fascinating caves. When interviewed, Patrick would say, 
everything looks better in the dark when you aim a light at it. The feeling of weightlessness is the best. If you happen to get into a cave where no one has ever been before, it's fun. All of the men had experience of the Plura Caves other than 34-year-old mechanical engineer Yari. However, he was a well-versed and reliable cave diver with lots of experience of skilled dives all over the world. He was known as someone who was methodical and disciplined and would be a strong link on the expedition. Kai and Patrick were the most familiar with the cave, having been the ones to actually discover the route they would end up taking with one of a diver. Discovering a new route and going somewhere no one has ever been is the pinnacle of achievement for thrill-seeking cave divers. The group intended to enter the Plura Cave entrance and travel through fully and semi-submerged cave structures to emerge through the Steinogeflathoc cave exit. They plan to travel a total of over 2,000 meters and reach a depth of 130 meters. An extremely difficult dive, even for the most skilled in the world. The dive was due to take a total of five hours, most of that time spent on the ascent, on the other side, to ensure they could emerge safely from the extreme underwater pressure. They arrived at Jawbrew Farm just after midnight, having driven for 15 hours in a van, loaded up with exploration gear and supplies. It had been a treacherous journey. The icy conditions and difficulties with the navigation system caused trouble from the off. Despite the tough journey to Plura, in terms of both the difficult day-long voyage as well as the psychological hurdle of returning to the caves after what they had experienced, the group felt confident and were excited for the challenge ahead. They settled down to drink a celebratory beer before turning in for the night. In the morning, snow blanketed the ground and temperatures measured minus 6 degrees centigrade. As it was still the depths of winter, the sun wouldn't rise till 9am and would shine low but bright the whole day, predicted to set around 4pm. While Yari made breakfast, Patrick set off early to look at the pond where the group would submerge. After their porridge, Kai, Visa and Yari took dry clothes and food to the cave for after the group surfaced. Yari H joined Patrick and the two set about cutting a hole in the ice at the pond with a chainsaw. The ice at the pond was about a foot thick and glittered in the sun. The rocky pond visible below through the remarkably clear water. There was a sense of excitement and anticipation in the air as the two groups joined and prepared their gear. Yari H and Patrick prepared to descend first, while Kai recorded a cheerful video, playfully referring to his friend Yari H as Hamstery, a name meaning hamster, reflecting his laid-back nature. The five men would be diving with the assistance of underwater scooters and closed circuit equipment known as rebreathers. The benefits of using closed circuit equipment as opposed to open circuit equipment is that divers can stay submerged for longer, don't need as much equipment and can fit into tighter spaces. The technology works by recycling the diver's exhale absorbing the carbon dioxide and adding oxygen. The decision to use this equipment is standard for this type of diving with obvious benefits but can bring complications which would later prove fatal. This group of experienced divers were all familiar with the use of such technology and understood the need for a plan B, carrying spare rebreathers as well as an open air circuit cylinder. Using their underwater scooters, Patrick and Yari plunged below the surface into the two degree water first, just after midday. The light disappearing quickly as the cave sloped downward for the initial 500 meters. They reached a depth of 24 meters 
before briefly rising to a 250 meter long empty chamber, only partially submerged in water. After that, the cave descends a lot more dramatically, allowing only very experienced divers to navigate it. At this point, it's not possible to use the underwater scooters, and the passages become tight, requiring divers to use their hands to manoeuvre the narrow channels very carefully. A tear in their suit on the rough limestone would be fatal at these depths in those temperatures. Patrick and Yari use the guidelines to reach the deepest part of the cave, just over half an hour into the dive. There, they found a round plate left there by Kai and Patrick when they had previously discovered the route. With their initials, the date and the phrase, Denyava Finn, meaning the damn Finn, a reference to the not-so-friendly competition between the Finnish and Norwegian divers. Due to the cave's location, the Norwegian diving community had tried to lay a claim on its exploration, with the link between the Plura and Steinglufagut entrances was discovered by the group of Finnish explorers. Alrid Asurud, of the Norwegian Real Action Diving Group, said, and quote, according to an unwritten gentleman's agreement, no new lines should be laid if there's an ongoing exploration project in the caves. Finnish diving groups have disregarded this completely. In some sense, the goal was taken from right under our noses. Efforts of over 10 years became worthless. Norwegian divers had believed the route to be too dangerous to attempt without more planning and exploration. It was just after this point, an hour into the dive at 10 past one, that Yari ran into problems. Patrick describes, I saw Yari waving his light up and down. The divers signed for distress. Yari asked Patrick to help him remove one of his bailout cylinders, but Patrick soon discovered that it was actually the line of Yari's scooter. Patrick moved out of the way, but then Yari shouted to him that he needed the backup circuit cylinder. Patrick has since said, I knew then that the situation was serious. I handed him the mouthpiece from my cylinder. Yari took maybe 10 breaths and then switched back to the rebreather. Patrick watched him do this a few times, but in the ensuing panic, he saw his friend swallow water and die in front of his eyes. Shocked and horrified, Patrick began to lose control of his breathing. A desperate situation for a diver, 110 meters below water. Using equipment which couldn't filter carbon dioxide quickly enough, should the user begin to hyperventilate. Hypercapnia occurs when the rebreather fails to efficiently absorb the carbon dioxide exhaled by the diver. This can occur with little to no warning, causing the diver to slip into unconsciousness, lose their mouthpiece and drown. Patrick had no choice but to try and compose himself and move forward. He was no stranger to dead bodies in the water due to his extensive rescue work experience. But this was the first time he'd witnessed this tragic fate befall one of his best friends. He couldn't go back to warn the rest of the divers due to the blockage now caused by Yari H's body. And the extra time spent trying to help him had added hours onto his diving time. Decompression sickness, or the bends as it's known, is another considerable danger to divers. A rapid decrease in the water pressure that surrounds you can lead to joint pain, paralysis, rashes, or even death. For every minute spent at a depth of 110 meters and pressure of 12 bars, 10 minutes could be added to the duration of the dive in order to ensure he could come to the surface safely. This would turn a five hour dive into an eight or nine hour one, leaving his margin for error incredibly small. Even the most minor incident could prove deadly. 
and he'd already left the oxygen cylinder with Yari, as well as giving him some of his bailout gas. His journey onwards became a bleak one, filled with anxiety, imagining the rest of his friends discovering Yari's body. He became certain that they wouldn't be able to get past him, or they would panic, causing their apparatus to fail. He imagined a long drive back to Finland, alone, and that was only if he managed to make it back to the surface himself. In order to prevent decompression sickness, he would have to make regular stops, acclimatizing to the new pressure, alone in the cold and dark. The true horror of the situation lay heavy on him. Meanwhile, back at the Plura Cave pond entrance, the second group prepared to descend the sump. In two hours' time, they would discover Yari's body. Their own journey hadn't been perfect. Kai was positioned at the back of the group, looking out for his fellow divers, which was typical behavior from someone described as quiet and diligent by his friends. Visa led the way. He had packed more cylinders than they had brought the first time as a precautionary measure, but they had gotten stuck at a depth of 125 meters sliding through an opening that was less than one meter wide. He had to abandon two of them to fit through. Then, one of his fins got stuck in the guidelines and Yari Yu had to dislodge it for him. Vesa was irritated by the prospect of the time added to the dive, as well as the fact that they'd have to return to the cave for the abandoned cylinders. But he pressed on, not concerned for his safety at this point. After passing the deepest point and the round plate they had left on the previous dive, Vesa heard a beep, the distress signal of a breathing apparatus somewhere in the vicinity. Then he saw the body. He tried not to look at his friend to control his natural impulse to panic. He began to shed his gear in order to maneuver past his friend's corpse. He tried to shout behind him that Yari H was dead and that he tried to find a way through. What ensued was a frantic few minutes that would see the tragic voyage take another life. While Vesa was removing his fins to try and find a way through the blockage, Kai and Yari Yu followed up the back. Kai noticed Yari jerking strangely and swam to him with his bailout cylinder. I tried to calm him down by talking to him, Kai said. I made sure that he wasn't trapped and that the bailout gas was on. I was flabbergasted. As the situation continued, I realized it couldn't be a failure in the rebreather. A few moments later, Yari Yu was dead, having lost control of his breathing once he saw the body in the water. Kai swam on unable to let his thoughts linger on what he had just witnessed. Within seconds, he encountered the body of Yari H and saw Visa kicking desperately, trying to edge past his body without the assistance of his fins. He shouted to Visa that Yari Yu was also dead and screamed that they should turn back, allowing himself one moment of pure terror. But Vaser ignored him. He'd already come to the creeping realization that the way back was a far longer distance and that the time spent at such a huge pressure was already adding crucial minutes to the time it would take to safely emerge, trapping him even longer in this living nightmare. Kai worried that Vesa was losing control of his breathing due to physical exertion and would soon succumb. He also spared a thought for Patrick, assuming him to also be dead. He made the split-second decision to turn back, seeing it as his only way to survive the ordeal. Divers are experts at making tough decisions based on knowledge and initiative in high-pressure environments, both physically and psychologically. As Kai made his ascent back through the way he came, he mentally surveyed his remaining gear and tried to not let his mind linger on his drastically dwindling chances of survival. 
he weighed up the dangers of decompression sickness and the chances of running out of oxygen and decided to risk the bends. He held on to thoughts of his wife and three children to try and keep up his spirits in the bitterly cold water. Hundreds of meters away, on the other side of the traverse, Patrick saw a light in the darkness. Visa had managed to make his way through and catch up to his friend. It gave me strength, Patrick said, but both of them had stayed in the depths of the cave for far longer than they had intended and realized that they could no longer do the necessary compression stops. Despite the pure relief of finding each other, they weren't out of the woods yet. They ascended far more quickly than they should, Patrick faring slightly better due to his head start. The bends is caused when bubbles of gas form in the tissues of the body when under great pressure. If the ascent is too fast, the gas can't leave the tissue safely and the bubbles remain. Like in a bottle of coke, you only see the bubbles escape when you take the lid off and the quicker you do this, the more explosive the effect. In the human body, this can cause an embolism, can cause blood to coagulate and can affect the nervous system. The most famous and sinister looking symptom is extreme bloodshot eyes, known as mask squeeze. After what felt like days, Patrick breached the surface. By the time he made it to the cave exit, he had been underwater for nine hours, longer than he had ever been underwater before. He waited 90 minutes for his friend to ascend, noting the initial telltale signs of the bends in his joints. Exhausted and solemn, the pair made their way back to Jawbrew Farm to alert the authorities before heading to the pond to wait for Kai, hoping against hope that he'd turn back and would emerge unharmed. By midnight, there was still no sign of him. And so, feeling defeated and with a sense of doom, the men settled in for the long haul. At 1 a.m., 11 and a half hours after his descent, Kai, against all odds, managed to make it back to the cave exit, but found with horror that the hole that they had drilled had frozen over. With his last ounce of strength, he managed to break through it and clambered out of the water. He dragged himself to the van, switched the lights on and collapsed. When his friends rushed to his aid, he told them, never again will I put my head underwater. They, sir, suffered with serious decompression sickness due to his rapid ascent, causing tingling all over his body and problems with his walking and reflexes. He would have to spend time in a recompression chamber. Kai went on to suffer with extreme anxiety relating to diving. But when he heard from the authorities that they would not be covering the bodies of Yari Hutaranen and Yari Usmaki, he knew he would have to overcome those anxieties to revisit the scene of the worst moment of his life. A month later, on the 16th of March, a party of 27 Finnish and Norwegian divers gathered at the edge of the cave. Dignified but determined, two body bags laid respectfully at the entrance with a pair of black fins. Kai and Patrick were among the divers, while Vesa managed the party at the surface, still too ill to endure the water pressure. It was Patrick and his fellow diver, Sammy Pakunin, who managed to retrieve the men. I've been thinking about this every single night since I walked out here, Patrick said. Last time, I didn't know whether to come back up or stay down there. Finnish soldiers use a phrase meaning never leave a friend behind. Their culture take great pride in the lengths they went to retrieve the bodies of fallen soldiers in the war against the USSR. In this spirit, even though the diving rescue mission was illegal and not sanctioned by the authorities, there was no question that they would go back and retrieve the lost men. Even after the success, there was judgment from some aspects of the diving community about the safety of the mission, as well as a criminal investigation, but this was later dropped. 
None of this mattered to the men who were determined to bring their friends to peace. Two months and three weeks after the incident, Patrick Gronquist eventually carried his friend one last time to his final resting place as a pallbearer at his funeral. Despite everything, all three survivors continued to cave dive together, each journey a homage to the fallen divers, Yari Hutarinen and Yari Usimaki. Regardless of the dangers, I am glad that they managed to recover the bodies of Yari H and Yari U. What a terrifying way to go. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane.